podcast you're about to listen to is from a book series on post-qualitative, new materialist and critical post-humanist research. I'm Karen Meris and chief editor of this new Radlich series. You can find it on the following website, www.postqualitativeresearch.com. This chapter is from In Conversation with Karen Barad, Doings of Agential Realism, edited by Karen Meris and Vivian Bozalek. Preparing for this presentation prompted another returning to and remembering with threading, a practice and critical tool that forms the fabric or the bones of my chapter. On the screen, you see a slow video recording of the threading piece that I refer to in my chapter. I made this video yesterday. Not only has it helped me to re-enter into the past, present, future fray and prized open possibilities for future notes of inquiry, but it's also activated another return to the chapter and the ongoing conversation with Barad and their teachings that underpin so much of my iterative inquiry. I wrote the chapter at the time when I finished my PhD project and the beginning of the PhD project coincided with Barad's visit to Cape Town and the Monkey Valley workshop, which had a profound impact on my research um, journey, the ongoing reverberations of which continue to contour my practice. And so when Viv and Karen invited us to submit our abstracts for this book, I was very excited because it offered another way into my interests um, in exploring non-traditional modes of expression that were separate and linked to my PhD project. However, when it came to writing, I felt very stuck. I tried to write, but my thoughts and my words were knotted together. They were very dense, they were impenetrable. And I recognized and realized, as often is the case with me, that writing alone could not unravel what needed to be expressed. And I needed to find another way in and out of this conundrum, which prompted me um, to embark on a month of making with Barad, which materialized as a daily practice of threading and stitching through and with a leftover scrap of muslin mull fabric that I'd used in an artwork in 2010. So the chapter documents this artistic research process, as well as various threads of concern that surface through the daily practice. In this case, the open-ended process of thinking materialized with needles, cotton, and a piece of loosely woven muslin mail, which was held securely in place in a bamboo embroidery ring. And as I worked away, I came to understand that threading as a concept materialized diffractive readings as the ideas were threaded through one another. In prizing open these threads, I was able to explore important questions such as how could threading unravel conventional notions of what thought is? And how would threading together with needles and fabric open up the conditions of theorizing in ways that help me to understand who or what is doing the thinking and with what and whom is thinking happening? Quote a, a quote from Barad and Gandolfa, 2021, page 27. As the needle and thread move through the open weave of the mull, the tension pulls the perpendicular warp and weft grid out of alignment, and where once were right angles, there are now irreg irregular curves and wave-like lines that create curious winding topologies. They're markers and activators of new reverberations of thought. They had an uncanny resonance with an image that Barat shared in an online seminar I attended in June 2021. Set against a solid black background, the image was of a mathematical type diagram that was etched in white. It started lines moving horizontally across the lower section from left to right, and I was drawn to that image and felt compelled to ask about it. In response, Barat said, I'm not really sure what the background is, but I like it a lot because to me it's very evocative of wave functions and quantum mechanics. 
and a wave function is going to give you a sense of the different probabilities for things happening. I like the kind of other stuff that is happening with different waveforms, which to me is evocative of bringing more of what quantum field theory is doing rather than quantum mechanics. I felt drawn to the more of what the images might bring and how they speak to and through one another. And this reminded me of another image. It's a photograph I took of Vivian Bozilek, my supervisor, when we were visiting Studio Drift's exhibition entitled Coded Nature at Amsterdam's Stedelijk Museum. And we see Viv peering through the queen chair, which is part of the ghost series of chairs or objects that Studio Drift created. Now the collection consists of a king's chair, a queen's chair, a chair and a stool. And the sculptures manifest and mark the traces that humans leave on the bodies of the chairs and reference how unequal power relations mark the bodies of humans differently. At the time of writing the chapter, I was also in the process of conceptualizing a theory and history of fashion course for second year fashion design stu uh, students at the institution where I teach. And I realized that threading also opens up an interactive encounter with Studio Drift's cha queen chair as a throne and Mary Antoinette's scandalous muslin robe de Gaulle that reminds me of how fashion is, and I quote, shot through with social, political, economic forces and more, all the way to its core. Barad and Gandolfa. Caroline London argues that Antoinette's dress changed the world. As influencer extraordinaire, Antoinette's dress became a phenomenon that sparked ongoing effects. It sparked a craze that had radical effects on the cotton plantation industry in the American South and an increased demand for slave labor to work in the cotton fields. It also caused a boom in the British textile industry, the banking and shipping industries in London and New York, and that, had, that provided cap capital to purchase new lands for cultivation and enslaved workers and the growth of empires. The dress also depressed the local French manufacturing industry that reinforced public opinion that Marie Antoinette Queen was a traitor. As I follow the zigzagging yarns that span past, future and present, I mull over the ethical ramifications of threading as a diffractive practice for teaching an anti-colonial fashion theory course, especially one in South Africa. And I wonder how these hauntings might be foregrounded in pedagogical practice, curricular studies and history in ways that highlight matters of concern pertaining to fashion studies at a Cape Town University of Technology. I also wonder how this might be done in ways that prioritize students and my own responsibility. I also consider the implications of my own troubled genealogy in touching on my own hand in these haunted histories, I also come into contact with Barad's figuration of matter as condensations of responsibility. And I wonder how I might move beyond merely naming myself as being of settler descent and face up to the dangers, risks and damages that may be repeated and reiterated during class classroom encounters. I wonder if it's possible to teach these sedimented and haunted histories in ways that resist and trouble these repetitions. Considering one's own hand is not limited to me. It also calls on students' responsibility as becoming fashion designers. And I wonder how threading might activate an ethical consciousness that goes against the grain of the fashion industry's dependency on trends and, quote, parroting the shape, look, feel of anything in order to make it seem attractive and desirable. Wang, 2018. Threading enacts a diffractive stitching together apart 
that has given me a language to express my thinking about thinking differently. The bamboo frame becomes a portal through which I iteratively return to the disturbing questions that surfaced and interfered with the surface during Barad's 2017 seminar. By threading through the mull, the questions that matter to research practice start to make sense. Through the threading practice, I begin to honour our inheritances and understand that we are of the world rather than in the world. And in uncovering iterative matters of concern, the gentle cuttings together apart confirm for me that there is no totality, no determination or cut that is once and for all. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you would like to know more about this chapter, please visit the website www.postqualitativeresearch.com and please stay tuned for future podcasts.